when we talk about protein in a food context, and especially if you're talking about protein in the context of a restaurant, you generally mean a meat or an animal-derived product, such as chicken or perhaps an egg. But protein, of course, comes from a number of sources. And uh, as far as I know, all living things use protein as part of their ability to be alive. Therefore, you find some level of protein in everything from a tomato to a steak. An amino acid looks like this. We have a new chemical in the game, which is nitrogen. And you can see that an amino acid has two ends. We refer to one end as the nitrogen end and the other end as the acid end, often. And there's something else that's special about this now. Imagine there's the required hydrogens to make up the bonds everywhere, with the exception of right here, where there's this thing that chemists call R. And R is a uh, stand-in for any of a number of side groups. The standard side groups that show up in creatures like us are shown here in this image. So you can probably get the sense right now that if I'm going to take this basic building unit here and make a polymer, which is a molecule that consists of this repeated um, many, many, many hundreds of times, as was the case, for example, in starch, um, this is going to turn into a super complicated picture really fast because look at all these potential side groups. So an important thing to know for those of you who haven't taken biochemistry is any given protein will be made up of a more or less unique sequence of these proteins that have been encoded by the organism's DNA. And what that means is that proteins will have a very particular composition and a very particular shape, which allows them to do uh, very interesting and important jobs uh, in uh, living things. Now, a lot of that is not super important in food class, uh, if you think it sounds interesting, and it is totally fascinating, I recommend you take a class in biochemistry. But uh, for our purposes here, what this means is that we are going to change how we draw this. Instead of drawing the proteins like this, zoomed down to the level where I can show you the atoms, I'm instead going to often represent proteins, oh, I don't know, like that, where a tiny little element, say if you could zoom in right here, would be the individual amino acid. And we have to do this because, relatively speaking, proteins are huge. So you recall we talked about sugar. Sugar has a molecular mass or molecular weight in the hundreds, you know, um, like, you know, 300 uh, molecular weight. Whereas starch, a good starch, repeats that hundreds upon hundreds of times. So you get in the thousands, ten thousands, and a protein, oh, and a fat, a fat somewhere in the middle there. Fats can be about the same mass as sugars, um, or um, that would be a very, very small fat. Um, a more typical fat is uh, a little bit heavier than that. And then you get to proteins, and proteins, a small protein might be the same size as a big starch, but you could actually uh, go up to uh, 100,000 molecular weight units for a protein. Proteins are big. When we talk about a uh, piece of food being high in protein, we are generally talking about that food having come from a muscle. There's a muscle for you. And muscles have structural protein. 
think about in terms of yourself. Uh, your muscles allow you to move, and it is the protein that is in there that is forming the fiber bundles that uh, allow your muscles to contract. So uh, two particular proteins are very popular here. They're called actin and myosin. We can also find protein uh, dissolved in water. Um, if you think about an egg white, that's pretty much a pile of protein dissolved in water. And there we see an example of protein that's not being structural, it's being more soluble. Now, an important part of protein having its particular shape is that if you heat it up, or in fact change its conditions in any way, so Q stands for heat, but we could also perhaps mess with uh, the pH by adding acid or a base, or we could even add a whole bunch of salt. Um, any of these actions can make the protein change its shape. And its shape is so important to its function that we have a special word for it, denature. And that doesn't have to be written with a hyphen, I just did it that way because I ran out of space. Proteins denature, and the most common way to denature them is when you heat them up. So if you imagine I've got an egg and I cook it, then I end up with a cooked egg and the soluble protein stops being soluble anymore and becomes an interlinked mass of, so let's imagine we could zoom in here and what we see instead of having protein in their nice shapes individually, we see it, all the protein has kind of gone floppy and all knotted together. And that's why it's gone from being something that was kind of dissolved in the solution to being something that behaves like a solid. Just imagine how uh, a mass of tangled spaghetti sort of behaves like a solid instead of like individual strands. And uh, this uh, property of proteins can be really useful uh, from a culinary perspective as we are making food. Um, also, uh, by denaturing proteins, they stop doing their original function. And that's going to uh, be important for when we want to do things like preserve food, because a, uh, a microorganism, here we go, here's a happy little microorganism, it, like all other living things, is full of proteins that make it go. And if you hit it with enough heat, part of what you're doing that causes it to not be a viable microorganism anymore is potentially denaturing important proteins that stop it from being able to function. Protein is also yummy and protein, of course, can react with the other food molecules that we've been talking about. Uh, chiefly, we're going to talk uh, a bit in the future about a really important reaction between protein and sugar, which uh, makes yummy foods. And one final thought, as noted earlier, there is protein in every living thing that I know of. The issue is, why, you know, why don't we eat celery for its protein then? Well, we don't eat celery for its protein because it is a very, very small fraction of the overall mass of the celery. Whereas in a thing like a muscle, where protein is doing the heavy lifting, that was an intended pun, um, it is a much, much larger fraction of what's there. And it turns out humans, there you go, there's a human, we're not going to eat the protein, but humans can't synthesize all of those different amino acids. So the only way for you to get some of them is by eating them. And so, uh, as is the case with many uh, items that we use for food, uh, we don't just eat it so that we have molecular energy at our disposal. We eat it because there literally is no other way that that compound comes to be inside us. When you hear people talk about essential amino acids, that's what they're talking about. The ones that 
we as humans can't synthesize that we have to derive from our diet. 